Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, this is Darren. Welcome to the Touch MBA Podcast. And wow, I just had an incredible conversation with Emma Fisher, who is an NYU Stern alumni. She graduated one year ago. And uh, this was one of the conversations that after we recorded, I quickly raced to my uh, folder on my computer to make sure that, you know, the entire conversation was captured because... Uh, It it was really, really insightful for me, and I hope it will be uh, as insightful for you. And what we did was talk about visas for international students who are targeting top MBA programs in the U.S. and want to work in the U.S. after their MBAs. This is a huge concern, obviously, with the limited number of visas that are available to international MBA graduates. This is something that as Emma and I discussed, is not really considered during the application process because the application process is so intimidating. There's so much to do. There's enough to worry about, right, when you're applying. But I do want our listeners, especially our international listeners, to get that perspective of an alumni who has graduated from a top school and see what she had to go through and what her concerns were during the MBA program and after the MBA program when it comes to applying for visas, for internships, for H-1Bs, etc. Those of you who are in that position, please listen to this entire thing. Uh, I just think there's a lot of value here and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Before we dive into that conversation, just a reminder that we do have a website here at Touch MBA. We offer free school selection help to applicants. So take advantage of that. Go to touchmba.com, submit your CV, tell us what you want to do, tell us which schools you're targeting, and we'd be happy to give you some school recommendations, evaluate your competitiveness, and perhaps give you some pointers that that will help you with, with your application as well. So go check that out. And now to my conversation with Emma Fisher. There's been this concern from international MBA applicants about getting jobs and visas in the U.S. after attending top U.S. business schools. And as a U.S. citizen myself, I take this for granted. Uh, This isn't something I need to worry about. But I know we do have a ton of international uh, listeners and applicants who are looking to attend top U.S. programs, want to work in the U.S. after getting their MBA. And I wanted to give a on-the-ground account of what this is like as an international student and the challenges you might face and, and what you can you know, learn from this whole process by talking to a recent NYU Stern alum, Emma Fisher. Emma, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me. Emma, in in preparing for this podcast and researching the different uh, visas and H-1Bs and so forth, it was stressful for me. And I'm not even a part. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not even a part of this process. And and just preparing for our conversation was stressful. So uh, but before we get into kind of the weeds uh, of of the whole visa process, could you just quickly give uh, an introduction of yourself and, and your background for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emma. I'm a Canadian citizen. I live in Toronto. And pre-MBA, I was working in finance. So I worked for a private equity fund based here in Toronto. And I kind of did a combination of business development, finding new deals, and then sort of progressed to an associate level role where I worked on deals. And great job for a lot of people. But I knew that finance wasn't Uh, I guess my passion in life and I really wanted to get into the retail and luxury space. And so that's when I started looking at MBA programs to make that transition. And specifically, I targeted 
schools in New York in the Northeast because I had read that a lot of the schools there were developing programs specifically for luxury marketing and retail. So my sort of top three schools were Wharton, Columbia, and NYU because they had these programs. And I ultimately, like many of you, I wanted to work for like a global firm, preferably in New York after I graduated to make my entrance into a new industry. So I went through, you know, obviously the application process. Stern was by far the best fit for me. That's where I got an offer. And then I made the move down to New York. Program there was wonderful. I focused on luxury marketing. I interned at Nordstrom out in Seattle, as well as Barney's in New York. So I had great internship experiences, got some great brands on my on my resume, but certainly finding that full-time offer um, and having to be sponsored was a challenge. And so I'm, you know, pretty direct and open person, and I, you know, definitely appreciate that this that this podcast is going to help people make uh, life-changing decisions. So I'm certainly not going to, uh, I would say, sugarcoat my experience, but I also want to be very encouraging of, you know, going to these amazing programs. And I loved going to my school. So, you know, you'll sort of hear me um, offer somewhat of a balanced point of view. And I hope that that's kind of what you're looking for. That's exactly what we're looking for. And I'm I'm so glad uh, that I was able to meet you and and get you on the show through our mutual friend, Allison. Shout out to Allison there. Um, Big shout out to Allison. (laughs) (laughs) Let's get into um, this this visa process. So first, could, could you help just give me a high level overview of how the US visa process works for international students at, at the top MBA programs? Sure. So, so the main visa is called an F1 visa, and that's the, the standard um, student visa that the U.S. schools give out to, to students. So I was, you know, in prepping for this, I was trying to remember exactly what the, the application process was like. But from, from what I recall, you know, these, these top programs have international offices and they deal with this stuff all the time. So from what I recall about actually getting the F-1 visa, it was not um, like a challenge. It's not like getting a green card or something. It's, you know, they're used to um, giving these out. You basically just submit your information. Um, the school helps you, at least NYU, they, they walk like handheld me through the process. And as soon as you, you know, accept the offer, as an international student, the first thing that they want you getting on is, is, is all the, the visa type of stuff and making sure everything is all set up so that, you know, when you show up to New York or when you show up at the border and you're trying to get in, like everything will go as smoothly as possible. So I found that that Stern was really, really great at that. And I had no issues getting an F1 visa. Got it. OK, so that's so the F1 visa, that's the student visa. Right. Yeah. And that will last your entire time as a student. At Stern. Exactly. Exactly. So generally it's, so it's the two years. um, So you have to have maintain a a, a full course load, right? So that I think that, you know, there's a number of requirements, but the main thing is you got to be enrolled at, you know, credit institution and you have to have a full-time course load. And the great thing about the F1 is that um, it does allow you to intern either for free or in turn for money. So um, you can earn money under it, which is great. One thing to be careful of though, if you do want to intern for free, I believe there is a nine month waiting period. So for example, um, when I first started at Stern, I actually wanted to do a free internship at Chanel when I first started because I wanted to just like get right in there and And um, I wasn't able to do it, despite the fact that I got an offer for it. Um, And that's simply because there's there's this nine month waiting period and there's kind of no other way around it. So that's like one tip right there. So I'm sorry, a a nine month waiting period from when you get the F1 visa? No, from when you start going to school. So when you start going to school. Okay. mm -hmm. So I wanted to do an internship. I believe it was my second semester. Um, And I wasn't able to do it because I had not been going to school full time for nine months in the U.S. yet. Got it. Very good. Yep. 
then I went to Nordstrom between year one and year two, and so was able to obviously earn money there. And um, you are limited to the number of months you can work under the F1 visa. I believe it's 12 months. So it's just something to keep, you know, be mindful of that if you do want to do all these internships and get paid, then that will ultimately come off of what you have available at the end when you graduate. And so the F1 um, allows you to work after you graduate. Wait, I think it's in total during your school and after you can work in total 12 months under the F-1 visa. So, for example, if you started your internship at Nordstrom's in summer, in summertime, mm -hmm. that means that you would still be able to work after your second year for one summer because because that's 12 months. So, so I so I worked for three months at Nordstrom. So I still had nine months left if you will, after I graduated. And um, the F1, it basically, by, from the time that you graduate, there's a time, like there's a, um, a limit to how long, I think you can stay in the country for 30 days. Um, and otherwise you have to show proof that you have a full-time offer and that you're going to work. But if you have gone to school in the US, you have no intention of working in the U.S., you have to vacate 30 days after you graduate. Yes. And yeah, just one note here. Clearly, these things will maybe change over time depending on you know U.S. immigration and visa policy. But the idea of our conversation here is so that you get an idea of what to consider. We were chatting a little bit before the podcast started about how so much of the focus is based on, you know, the application process itself, which is so intimidating by itself. So it's not like we're blaming applicants, but but the idea of this this episode is to give you an idea of, of what to expect throughout the entire process of business school and after. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point because I would say uh, I, I particularly bonded with a lot of other international students because we were all going through the same thing. And actually, I think all, all of my closest friends ended up being um, other international students because, um, you know, we obviously understood each other and had to help each other a lot through the process. It's, it's not to dissuade people from going to an international school or, or you know, going to schools in the U.S., but it is definitely something to to keep in mind, and, and I think ultimately you have to weigh out what your what your plan is after the MBA. And I know again, like we all focus on, like I just want to get into this school, and then my life is set. Well, two years is going to go by really, really quickly, and then you kind of got the rest of your you know your life to plan out. So I guess the sort of just like because I never quite finished my your, your first question so so I ended up interviewing after I graduated in New York and I had an offer that fell through because of the visa situation so then I returned back to Toronto and got a job very quickly at a firm that I really wanted to work for and then in retail in luxury marketing so I absolutely ended up in the space that I wanted to be in and in the role that I wanted to be in but I actually found that 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 opportunity was back here in Canada for me that it wasn't going to be in the U.S. So that's just to sort of like give the give the full picture that it, it does, you know, it does happen where you really want something, but um, unfortunately, circumstances like these don't always work out in your favor. Oh man, yeah. So let's let's talk about the those circumstances. So after that F one uh, student visa expires. You, did you apply for the OPT, the Optional Practical Training? Yeah, and so that's your 12 months that I was referring to before. So there's, there's two things. There's CPT, I think it's Curricular Practical Training, and I think that's kind of like your free internship type of stuff. And then your OPT, which most people are saving for the, for the up to a year after, after you graduate. And I think you apply for... Um, it's. It, and please stop me answering it. Like all these acronyms, it can be really confusing. So, like just all these letters and numbers and everybody's thinking, what is this? So I, I believe, um, so you, you're still under F1 and you want to use your OPT um, after you graduate to stay in the U.S. 
you apply for an EAD card, which I think is essentially an employee authorization designation, something or other. And it, it, it basically, it means that, okay, you're still under F1 and then they issue you this photo ID card so that, you know, every time, especially as you go in and out of the country, you have something to present. And so you don't have to be sort of making this case every time you're at the border. Got it. But then uh, with that EAD card, then you have to apply for OPT? So the EAD card is essentially, no, that is like your validation of OPT. So what you be doing is like you're under the F1, you have a job offer or whatever it is, and then you submit all your application and say, yes, I want to use my OPT under the F1. And I believe that then they issue the EAD card. So, so I actually applied for an EAD card because I wanted to try and stay in the U.S. and work. One thing to, so, so let me make two points. The first one is the whole idea of the OPT and like bridging you under F1 for that year after, it's to allow you to, to apply for other visas that are more permanent. So it's basically meant to act as a bridge in the meantime while you try to apply in the H1B lottery process, which is another topic we can get to next. But that's, that's what the intention is. It's sort of to like extend that runway so you can stay, you can still interview, you can work, um, and then you can find an employer to um, consider you for sponsorship, either H-1B, which is the most common, or I guess if you were going to go for a green card. But to get that EAD card to... to you know, stay on the, <laughs> these acronyms are crazy. I know. Sorry, I'm I just like, I, yeah. so, but this is good because I'm a total newbie to this too. So hopefully that will help our well, listeners. It's something, it's something you would never think about, right? It's like when I had a friend here in Canada and he was coming over from the UK and I just thought, you know, our bias as Canadians, we just think we're super friendly and we let anybody walk in here. And then he's telling me all his woes about even just immigrating into Canada. And I was like, oh, I guess as a Canadian, you never thought about that. And it's the same thing. If you're a US citizen, it's just something you'd never think about. Exactly. So for this OPT, do you have to be employed to get it? So you have, yeah. So you have to have a proof of an offer of employment or prove that you are, um, yeah, that you're going to be employed. So what I did because I did not have a full time offer was um, I actually reached, and this is a very common strategy um, by us international folks. So you don't have an offer when you graduate, but you want to stay in the US and you want to obviously do interviews and you want to recruit. What I did and a number of other people did was um, we reached out to a friend who was starting their own business. And we said, hey, I can use my CPT, which is basically the free interning piece of the F1, and say, here, like, let me help you out with your business for free. Let me do this for like a month or two. And then this will allow me to basically stay in the country. So that's, that's what I did. I had a friend from school and she was starting her own company. And I basically went back and forth between Toronto and New York as I had interviews Cause you know, like I have a house here and my husband was still based here in Toronto. So I just went back and forth. And every time I was at the border, like I had that letter from her that said I was her employee and that, you know, I was doing this type of work and then it was fine for me to go in and out of the country. Moving from the F1 visa, basically you have to secure some sort of employment, whether it's that free internship under the CPT or yeah. full-time employment under the OPT. Uh, yeah. Uh, within 30 days of graduation. So you don't, yeah. So you don't have to, so this is a little tricky. And again, like I'm going to make this legal disclaimer. I'm obviously not an immigration lawyer. So like, I'm not liable for any of this, but the, so the thing is like when you apply for the EAD card and even when you lottery for H1B, while you're in the process, while you are being processed, by the US government, you are not supposed to leave the country. A lot of this visa situation, it becomes, it, it becomes more of an issue when you leave and you try to re-enter. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So it's really more about, um, and for me, because my husband was here in Toronto, I, and 
like I did need to leave the country a lot. So I probably made it a little bit more complicated for myself versus if you graduate and you just stay, I mean, I'm not promoting like just illegally stay, <laughs> so, you know, but um, I, I think if, if you just graduate and you stay and you're looking for work, I mean, at some point you are going to have to, they, they are going to know that you're still in the country because you've graduated. But a lot of this is, there's a bit of gray area because it's about when you notify um, the government that you're still like that you've graduated and that you have secured full-time employment. So I think it would be like, if you were staying in the U S like say staying over the summer after you graduated and it was just a matter of, you know, I don't think you would have to sort of have that like legal letter about you're working for like a startup or something, because if you're not trying to reenter the country, like they've got bigger fish to fry. So it's, it's kind of, it, you need to be careful when they're processing you though, because you're technically not supposed to leave the country and you might have a really hard time reentering. So, and it's the same thing with the H1B lottery. Once you start applying, you can't leave the country because they're not going to let you back in. And that's something that most people don't know. And they don't, you don't understand that like, say, you know, you are from, let's say you're from Hong Kong. And so you've, you know, come to the U S and you're getting processed for your H1B. Well, you know, you're going to start work full time and you want to take a vacation or you want to go back and see your family or you want to, do, you can't do any of that. So a lot of people have to understand that once you're sort of in this process with the U.S. government, it is very like you will stay and be put and you will be told what you're supposed to do. Because if you do anything that throws off the process, all it would take is trying to reenter and if you don't have all your ducks in a row or the paperwork's not complete, they can sim simply turn you away and just deny you. And then there's, you know, uh, and again, I'm not saying this to like be threatening or to like, you know, make people quake in their boots. But I would say the the main point is that once, once you want to start working in the U.S. and going through the process, you are very much at the mercy of what the process is. Got it. No, that's crystal clear. And that's something I, I didn't even know. And so this is this is really good. Let's move on to the H-1B. From what I've read, you the employers apply for that H-1B in April, and then the the applicants or you guys are notified in October, whether you you win the lottery, right, so to speak. Yes. How, how does that work? Like, did you apply for that in your second year, or do most people do it after after they graduate? Great question. So I did not apply for it in my second. So. I received a full-time offer from Nordstrom, but you know, my husband and I wanted to stay on like in the Northeast. And um, if I had accepted that full-time offer from Nordstrom, which I received shortly after my summer, summer internship, then I, th then Nordstrom would have started the process for me right away so that I would have been ready for that. During your second year, that April. Exactly. That April lottery. So like you graduate in May. So I would have been ready for that lottery in April and I would have known whether or not I got it. So there's, yes, if you have a full-time offer, like say you've done your internship and you received an offer right away, then your employer would start that process for you right then. So that in your second year. And that's basically the goal for most international students, right? Because then you're ahead of the curve. Exactly. If you, if you don't get it in your second year, then like I said, the, uh, like with the F1 and the EA, getting your EAD card, that's your extension runway. And so then what you do is you have that in place so that you can apply again the following year. Yes. Okay. And see what your chances are then. So you, you more or less, like, given that you intern somewhere and you get a full-time offer, you, you have two chances of, of getting the H-1B. So, you know, if, if we were to talk about what are the best ways to increase my chance, like if that's the, the priority is to stay in the U.S., well, then you want to intern, get a full-time offer and be able to apply that first time before you graduate, as well as have the opportunity as a, as a backup to try to apply the second time. Yes, that's very clear. And just to take a step back, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the H-1B lottery, uh, Emma, correct me if I'm wrong, 
But basically, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, another acronym, which I won't say, <laughs> uh, they receive, uh, like last year, they received the most petitions. So it was like 236,000 petitions, okay, to get this H-1B visa. They only have, the U.S. only has, at least right now, 65,000 slots. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, and that's for regular quota. So that's for like undergraduate international students as well. And then they have a 20,000 quota amount for U.S. master's degrees. So that's what, as an MBA graduate or as a you know master's in, in a science or medical field or engineering uh, a field, that's what you're all trying to get, right? You're trying to get one of those 20,000 um, slots, which is determined by a random lottery. Is that is that correct? That is correct. So, um, I mean, you. It sounds like you have more updated numbers than I had at the time, but I was I was generally told that your H one B lottery chances are sort of like twenty to thirty percent. And so now, and I would say probably now, like sort of like two years later, the number of applicants keeps going up every single year, and the number of H-1B visas that the U.S. government is giving out has not increased. So um, I'm assuming that it's lower than the, you know, we could do the math, but it's lower than 20% chance. So the, the, the point is, is that like, you don't have a, a great chance of, of getting it. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, obviously. It's just that you have to be mindful of those statistics. And it is totally a random lottery. Um, nobody's That's like- That's crazy. Favorite of, <laughs> exactly. So it, it is- it is a lot, and it and it can be, um, it can be a little bit overwhelming and almost seem like unfair that you've, you know, you've put in the same effort to get these applications and get into your dream school. You've paid all the money to be there. You've made the efforts, and that it's going to come down to this complete random selection. That's why I think it is again. If your focus is, I want to stay in the U.S. You, you do everything you can to increase your chances of that happening. And for sure, one is going to be is getting your second, like getting the H-1B lottery twice and, and um, taking the offer from your summer internship. Right. OK, so I'm just going to say this one more time. There's no difference if you went to Harvard Business School versus another business school that's ranked 100. Uh, there's Absolutely no there's not. no difference whether no difference. you're going for a marketing industry or you're going for finance industry. No, my understanding is that there there is not, and I know that out in Silicon Valley, um, I know a ton because obviously, like think about the people that make use of the H one B the most. A lot of it is um, engineers, the international engineers that are going to work in tech. So I know that, um, you know, a lot of the, the big shots out in Silicon Valley, they are massively lobbying for to increase the number of H-1B visas and make them more flexible, especially with bringing partners. I mean, we haven't even gotten into that conversation, but the H-1B visa, even if you get it, that doesn't mean your spouse can work on it. And for a lot of people, that's that's a huge life changing decision. So that is and, and the H-1B is um, it can be up to. I think six years and generally it's three years at a time. So it's like you lottery, you get it for three years. And then once you've, once you've lotteried and you get it, then I believe it's just a matter of renewing. So you don't have to lottery, be grateful that you got lucky and then have to go through the lottery again. You only have to lottery and be successful once. Yes. Yes. Uh, that was, you stole my question. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. I mean, not to get into the politics of this, but in 2004, there were close to 200,000 slots. But then due to you know what, what has happened in the last 10 years, that has moved back down to that, you know, 80, well, 85,000. Let's get back to your, what you're doing and what you've seen your classmates do. So like you said, the best strategy is to give yourself two chances at that H1B. All right, so let's cross our fingers and say, yes, you got it. Okay, those people are set. Now, for those who weren't able to get it, those H-1Bs, yeah, what, what do they do? Let's start there first. Beyond the, the sort of the first thing that I said with the give yourself the two chances, what based on my experience and what I saw is that a way to increase your chance or at least have more flexibility 
is to recruit for traditional industries. And when I say traditional industries, I mean banking and consulting. Not everybody wants to do that, totally get it. But banking and consulting, they take in the highest number of MBAs. They have massive recruitment programs. They are well-resourced. They, they are global firms. They understand how to deal with international recruitment. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect. It's not that I recruited for it. But for example, uh, one of my classmates, Indian citizen, she went to NYU Stern, got an internship at Barclays, got the full-time offer, wanted to work in New York, did not get the H-1B lottery twice. She didn't get it. So heartbreaking for her. However, Barclays was able to say, no problem. We'll put you over in London for a year and then we'll figure out what to do from there. So at least there was that flex. And I'm not saying again, like I can't vouch for all the banks or all the consulting firms, but you know, there's some flexibility there where um, maybe you wanted to work in New York, but now you're more open to different offices around the world or that they're going to try to work something out for you. So, and I also know that, um, you know, consulting firms, again, professional services, global offices, they're used to moving people around. Like that's kind of the culture of what they do and they have the resources for it. So I would say that if, if that's your goal to stay in the U.S. and or, you know, let's say Western Europe, make a life there and want really like that's what you're going after. And I, I would really consider the banking and the consulting route because they're just going to be much more capable of probably dealing with that. The flip side is non-traditional, like anything I would say, you know, more like marketing, anything traditional corporate. Tech is kind of hard to say because tech is just, it can mean so many different things and there's so many startups now, but I would generally at this point consider tech like non-traditional for an MBA stream. Luxury retail, like what I did or anything retail, non-traditional. Those companies, they're just a lot less flexible. They have very different personalities in terms of how comfortable they are with ambiguity and their approach to hiring talent. And, and so you kind of just don't know what you're going to get. So that would be the second thing is, is I would say if you, if you want to do the consulting banking thing, then I think that will increase your, not just your, your chances. It would, it would um, I think, make your experience a lot better depending on what your goals are. Gosh, this is so good. Uh, thanks for sharing that. But did you notice, for example, outside of those you know, powerhouse uh, finance and consulting industries and firms. What about big multinational companies in tech, like more established companies in tech or in, in your industry, for example, or like a Johnson and Johnson, just to throw out like a, right. you know, that type of company that has been recruiting MBAs for a long time, even though they're in like, you know, uh, you know, consumer goods. Yeah. So what, what, I noticed was um, if they have big MBA programs, so yeah, I guess like, so marketing, like it depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about like some of the top, you know, conglomerates in the world, then again, I would sort of put them in the similar vein of like banking consulting. If let's put it this way, if, if a company has like a big MBA program and it's established and it's well-funded and it's a priority for the company, then that is going to increase your chances of them um, trying to work something out for you. doesn't mean necessarily that they will. It's just that if, again, the more global offices they have and the more invested they are in you. So if they've spent a lot of money on these programs That's to key, yeah. find and attract top talent and they've put you through the internship, they've made the, like they've spent money and time and effort on you. So they want to keep you. So it's kind of like just setting yourself up as best as you can versus if you just graduate and then you're going to talk to a company and they're like, yeah, we, we think you're great and this is a really great fit, but what if this whole visa thing doesn't work out? Then, you know, and you know what? It's okay. We'll just take somebody that has a green card. Like, it, you, like they're just, they're not as invested. So it's, it, when it comes down to, you know, the last two or three candidates, and you stick out like a sore thumb because you're going to have this complicated visa situation. To be honest, most recruiters are just going to, like, they're, they're going to make their own lives easier for them, right? Like, they don't really have this vested interest in trying to help you out. Okay, so two questions based on this, and I want to dive deeper. So first is, 
Would you recommend any resources or ways applicants can research these types of firms that have that MBA recruiting infrastructure in place? You go to the school's websites, most of them will have like, get a sense of who recruits there and what kind of industries recruit there. And, and then it's as simple as, so for example, like Amazon, massive MBA program, really robust. They're very invested in their talent. So um, I think they have one of the largest MBA recruitment programs of any U.S. company. Finding out who recruits there and then even like taking those handful of companies, okay, who like, I, I'm very interested in these four or five companies. Do they actually have an MBA program? And you want to actually do some research on what the, like how established the programs are, because it can be a little bit misleading. For example, you know, Bloomingdale's, they're owned by Macy's. Bloomingdale's used to have a very established MBA program because their former CEO was a Columbia Business School grad. And so he was very invested in that and he was a huge proponent of it. Change up of leadership, not so much into the MBA thing anymore and they actually start phasing it out. But it's not something they're going around in advertising. So you really have to, uh, what I did was a combination of, okay, who are the companies? Do they have an MBA program so they can understand the value of an MBA? Are they interested? And then, you know, I was very, I don't want to say aggressive, but I'm, you know, like I did a lot of cold calling and reaching out to, you know, even just using LinkedIn. And I reached out to, you know, some people who had done the Bloomingdale's program. And I just said, look, I just want to know what it's like. Are they, are they growing it? Is it contracting? Like what's going on? And, you know, I was told like, don't do it. They're pretty much phasing it out. So like, like don't spin your wheels on this. Cause they're going to make you jump through all these hoops. And I don't even think that they're hiring anybody this year. So it's, it's sort of that kind of, um, I would definitely use the, the school websites to see who recruits there, then take your companies and actually see if there's like a robust MBA program. And then how would they do that? Like, I, I mean, is the only way to do that, like trying to find colleagues or, or someone in your network that works there or? Yeah, I think. Um, Cause that, that sounds like. That sounds difficult. It is. It's a, it's a lot of legwork. I'm wondering if maybe poets and quants too, like resources like that, that have more of a list of kind of where top, like top recruiters, you know, and the statistics around that. I don't know anything off the top of my head. I think it's, there's probably some great resources out there, but you know, I'm kind of drawing a blank right now. Yeah. Well, what I'll do for our listeners, I'll research that. I'll see what I can find and I'll link to that in the show notes, you know, hope maybe Poets and Quants has like, yeah, the biggest MBA employers or, or some good article on this. Uh, I'll link to that in the show. That's a great idea. Uh, in the show notes, I mean, but I, I wanted to ask you one more question on, on what you said in terms of how being an international student might be a competitive disadvantage because of the visa process. I mean, obviously, if you're like a superstar, they're going to, you know, really try to to get you. But if you're, you know, in competition with three or four other people and half of them are from the U.S., it's just probably easier. Right. So what can international students do to, I mean, stand out in that process? Right. I mean, how can they if they're already at a little bit of a disadvantage, how can they? You know, what have you seen work with your classmates? Yeah, no. And I mean, I certainly had many international classmates that either stayed in the U.S. and, you know, got the jobs that they wanted. Mostly like kind of what I was saying before, kind of in those kind of bigger companies, like those industries, etc. Uh, so, so one thing is like you, you definitely want to flush out all your options in terms of visas, because there's a number of visas that we actually didn't talk about. And it depends on what country you're from. So for example, in Canada, we have another visa that's a bit of a gray area visa. It's called a TN1. And depending on your education and what you do for a living, it actually might work to your advantage. So it's very useful to um, any person that has a designation, like accounting, CFA, that type of thing. And so they can use that visa to their advantage. So very Canadian specific example that I'm giving you, but there may be other things that are out there that you don't even realize. So make sure you have a full understanding of what all of your options are. I think secondly, um, don't hesitate to engage one, the school that 
you know, that you're paying for, like what they can do for you, like definitely put them to work in terms of your international office. You should have some sort of like international career advice or something, and they, they should be able to help you with the process. I, I think it's, it's so much of it is about marketing yourself, right? <laughs> and that's pretty much all you're doing at these schools. What, what I tried to keep in mind was that, um, you know, whenever I would go for an interview um, and maybe if it came up or whatever it was, I would try to offer like a unique perspective. And a lot of these companies, they are going really, like they are, all these companies are global now, whether they like it or not, because they've got competition coming from online and like they're all global now. So I wouldn't shy away from marketing and showing that you have a global perspective. So that's one thing that I would do. The second thing is, um, you know, when you go into these, to these interviews, I would say that it, it's, it's a fine balance in terms of letting them know that you're international or not. And so it's sort of like, uh, you don't have to give it all up. You don't have to give it all away up front. Don't do that. So, oh, man. <laughs> I mean, it's brutal. Right? Like, <laughs> right? like so like, like, don't like walk in and, you know, by the third, you know, and question or whatever and saying, oh, well, you know, but then you would have to sponsor me and blah, like, don't, don't talk about it until you have to talk about it. And I would just keep that, um, you know, the, the fact that you bring a, a different perspective and that you have something unique to offer. I think a lot of firms are interested in that. So get them interested first. And then it's like, you can deal with the logistics later, because if you go in without that confidence, they're going to sort of pick up on that. So um, that's kind of that's kind of my advice. So when you say like that international perspective, because that seems to be like the key differentiator, right, for so many international students, is that uh, you can put me in these markets or I understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I would really go with, you know, because, again, a lot of people don't realize like how hard it is to move to another country, to set up a life, to make this investment. Like it's a huge risk. So. Um, you know, not shying away from the fact that you are, you take risks, you take very calculated risks. Um, you're flexible, you're adaptable, you understand other languages. So even if you only speak one, like it, it, you understand other, you understand other cultures. You can put me in any setting and I'm not, I'm not going to, you don't have to worry about me. And I think like kind of that, that resilience, I think that's what a lot of employers are looking for. Like there's going to be, yes, the technical you know, uh, aspects that they're going to look for, but your school will help you prep for that. But kind of that softer side, I think that's where you really sell yourself, right? Because these companies are looking for personality fit and it will surprise people when they go to these schools that a degree of perspective, humility, maturity is actually absent in a number of people at these programs. And it's not to say that, you know, everybody's super juvenile or anything, but I think that you, you stand out when, you, when you're really confident in the decisions that you make for yourself and that you can show employers that you know what you want, you know what you're going after, you know yourself, and that yeah, you have this capability of being in all kinds of different situations and you don't have to worry about me. I think employers really, really take to that perspective. That's gold because that's, um, I, I think MBA admissions officers and directors are looking for that too. I mean, it, it, transla it translates yep. all the way down. So I think that's just great application advice um, as well. One more question on the H1B. Let's say, for example, you, you're, you're in Toronto now. So my question is for those MBA graduates who, you know, unfortunately weren't able to either get an offer or get that H-1B, and maybe they're like two years out of business school or like three years out. Um, is it more difficult for them to apply for the H-1Bs if, if they do want to still work in the U.S.? Does, do, do you understand my question? So are you asking if you leave the country, like for a few years, can you still apply for an H-1B visa? Yes. Is that what you're asking? That's... No, you cannot. Oh, man. So... No. No. So so it's... How would um, that work? Yeah. Let, let me... So you would have to have... Um, 
Let, sorry, let me explain. So you would have to have um, an offer from a U.S. firm, and then you would go for the H-1B lottery. So I think maybe that's what you're asking. Yes. So, yeah, so you couldn't, um, I guess what I was thinking was that, you, like, you're definitely no longer F1 anymore. So you can't sort of just be, like, going in and out of the country and being able to apply for things. So, no, it would you would have to receive an offer from a U.S. company, and then you would go through that H-1B process that's what it would be yeah and my understanding is i don't think because for a lot of people the end goal is a green card like they want to stay and like that's where they want to make their life my understanding is that you would have to i don't think you can actually apply just off the bat for a green card you can't just start working and apply for a green card so i think it's like it's it's very um there's different levels and i don't know you might have a listener that corrects me but from what i um what i was told was that you definitely have to go H-1B first and then you can get to the level of applying for a green card. Or can't you just get like married to a U.S. citizen? I, I, don't, oh, even, no, I don't even know how that we works. Just, we could avoid all these acronyms and numbers if you just married the right person. <laughs> and trust me. So basically after an hour of intense like in the weeds discussion, just like get married to an American person. <laughs> There you go. It happens, it happens all the time. So yeah, so I mean, like I had international friends that, you know, they, it worked out that their spouse already had a green card and, you know, they got, they got married for love. I was there. I witnessed it. Yeah, no, no. So that's, so that's the thing. We've, we've just talked about what is technically available to you as a person on your own. There's other options of it. Yes, you could marry somebody with U.S. citizenship or a green card. Um, there's also, um, to your point about, okay, I'm back in Toronto and say, you know, you know, I want to go back down to New York and I'm interviewing and I, you know, want to work for this company. If that didn't work out, there's also another option of working for a company in your home country and transferring to a U.S. office. And that's an L1 visa. And that actually, um, for what I have read and Canadians I know that have made use of it, that's actually, that's one of the best visas because basically they transfer you down, like assuming your company pays for everything, they transfer you, you can start re- working right away because you've got this L1 visa. And the best part is if you have a spouse or a partner, they can transfer down under L2 and they can also work. So as long as you're employed under the L1, your spouse can work under L2, which is a huge differentiator from the H-1B. That's one of the biggest problems with H-1B is that your, your spouse can't work. So a lot of times, you know, when you're trying to economically make a move or take a job that, you know, makes sense for you and your family or your partner, if your partner can't be with you or they have to sacrifice their career, like these are, you know, big life decisions that they're going to have a huge, you know, these, these are people's lives. So yeah, there's like things to think about in, in that sense too. So I would say if you really want to get back to the U.S. or, or whatever it is, I would consider uh, companies within your own country or whatever country you're in, maybe have a look at companies that actually transfer or that have a U.S. office. And who knows, like maybe you start working for them, like I start working for one here in Canada and I say, like I pitch them on sending me to New York because I'm like, I went to school there and I understand this and I think I would be a great fit so there are options it's not to say that you you know once it's once you leave it's over I think it's just you know, understanding what your options are and understanding the chances around whether it's a lottery whether it's you know a different kind of visa trying to understand like how much of a life change is it for you to make this work for you and a lot of like my last point will be this, like the U.S. government, like they, they are overwhelmed with people that want to stay and work in the U.S. They are completely overwhelmed. So the process is designed to be difficult. They like it, it's not just that, like it's not personal. They're not saying we don't want you. It's just that they are so overwhelmed with immigration that their, you know, their priority is to try to find U.S. citizens jobs. And that's that's really what the system is. And it's designed to make you really frustrated and go, you know what? I'm just going to go back to Toronto and get a really good job. (laughs) So it's, you know, like it's kind of understanding that it's so hard not to take it personally. It does work out for a lot of people. I am 
very happy with the way things worked out for me. I've just taken a new job. I'm going to work for Canada Goose, which is an amazing global brand. And it's going to be a fantastic opportunity for me. And I could not be happier. And it's, it's kind of, again, going back to that, like international students are more flexible, they're adaptable. And it's like, you deal with these things that come and go because you're resilient and you can handle whatever comes at you and you're going to be successful no matter where you are. And I think that's, that's the advantage that you sell to the schools that you're applying to and those companies that you're recruiting for. Uh, That's really good. And so that, that L2 visa that you mentioned, there's no quotas for those. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. So um, again, less well versed than that and don't quote me, but my understanding with the L1, L2 is that it's, that's one that is definitely underutilized and it's uh, from what I've heard with the process, it's a lot easier. The challenging part isn't the visa. The challenging part is finding the company that's going to send you to where you want to go in the U.S. So. Last question. Did you notice any like what, uh, proxy countries in, in, in quotes? Like, for example, that students who wanted to work in the U.S., they weren't able to get the visa but they also didn't want to go back home. Did you see any trend there? Like, did for example, did a lot of uh, internationals go to Canada? Because you know we've heard a lot about Canadian visa policies being a bit more generous. There wasn't anything that that stood out to me. I would say it was it was kind of an even dispersion of, you know, the international crowd that recruited for and stayed in the U.S. There were um, a lot of international students that went back to their home countries, maybe started their own business. I think, I don't know, I think immigration in the UK is pretty challenging too. And then I, th- and then I think Canada, people were probably thinking, oh, that might be a nice place. And then they thought about the winter and they just said, yeah, no thanks. And went back to their home countries or something. But, but, can- but I know that, so I know that Canada has received a lot more interest of late. We, you know, we have a new government in place. Um, our prime minister is like getting a lot of attention. Yeah, and the Canadian economy is doing really well right now, and um, and we're starting to revive a lot of of industries. I would just say, in comparison to the like, obviously, like our banking sector is going to be minuscule compared to like New York or London. But so my husband, for example, he works for HSBC here in Toronto, and their team is really growing. And actually, a number of the UK guys are visiting Toronto because you know the teams are doing well here, and it's like the cost of living here is a fraction of that in like London and New York, and it's like a really great place to be. So. I think that MBAs and, and, you know, that type of personality and, and people that are really focused on their careers, I think they are starting to rethink like what kind of lifestyle that they want. And in some ways, like places like London and New York aren't exactly what they used to be. Insanely expensive to live in these cities. And uh, it's, it's, it's challenging times. So I think people are, are more open to, let's say, smaller or more niche cities, areas. Um, like a number of my classmates went to Seattle. A number of them went to San Francisco. And, you know, so it's sort of like being open to uh, the company or the brand or the opportunity that's there. And it's what you make of it. So, you know, the dream doesn't just have to be being in New York. It doesn't have to be that. Um, it's really what you make of it. And, and you'll quickly realize that, you know, once you get into these very intense and, and dynamic careers and jobs, you know, you spend all your hours with your coworkers and like what type of work culture it is. And like, that's what becomes important. And it's like, what kind of opportunity is there? And do I like the people that I work with? And am I challenged? And that is more important than for the sake of telling your friends that you, you know, have a hotshot job in New York because it, you know, the reality of life starts to come in. Well, let's, let's end it here. I mean, this is great food for thought. I love that final comment. It's really interesting how countries and cities position themselves to attract the best talent. And that's a whole nother, gosh, that's, you know, position papers. And that's, that's part two. We'll do another that, that, That's part two. But um, <laughs> no, I think that's a really great. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your perspective like a year out from the experience. This is uh, one of our longer episodes, but I- I'm confident that we're going to have a lot of listeners listening all the way through the end here because um, the insights were great. And uh, Emma, I can't thank you enough for 
sparing your time here and, and sharing your experience with us. I think this will help a lot of our listeners. Of so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. I was happy to chat. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.